Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today we will discuss the pathological aspects of diabetes mellitus related to pathogenesis and complications of diabetes mellitus. The pancreatic neuroendocrine part which is uh, present throughout the pancreas comprises uh, islet cells and the islet cells are uh, two types. One are the major hormone producing islet cells and other are the minor hormone producing. The majors are insulin, glucagon, somatostatin and pancreatic polypeptides. There are some uh, minor hormones which are also produced in the pancreas by the D1 cells which produces basoactive intestinal peptide and uh, enterochromophane cells which produce serotonin. There are various ways to demonstrate uh, pancreatic islet cells by immunostochemistry and the other is by electron microscopy. Majority of the pancreatic uh, islet cells are the insulin producing which are beta cells. They comprise about 70 percent of all islet cells and the others are alpha cells which produce glucagon, delta cells which produce metastatin and the PP cells which produce polypeptides. These uh, hormone producing cells can also be differentiated based on the character of these uh, neurosecretory granules. The different hormones produced by these neuros or stored in these neurosecretory granules, they have different shapes and based on the shape and size of these granules, one can differentiate between these hormone producing cells. For example, this is the insulin producing cells and these neurosecretory granules, they have a halo around these uh, electron dense material and they are crystalline, rectangular in shape, whereas the other hormones, they are rounded and the glucagon producing cells, these neurosecretory granules, they have um, the central electron dense part, the peripheral is part is less electron dense. So based on these characters, one can differentiate between the different hormones producing cells. So, diabetes mellitus, as we know that diabetes is characterized by the hyperglycemia. Basically, it is the abnormality of the glucose. As we know that glucose is produced by these insulin, is regulated by these uh, insulin secreting uh, cells, that is the insulin hormones. The other uh, glucose metabolism is also affected by the other hormones, for example, the glucagon. So, either there is uh, reduced insulin secretion that affect the glucose metabolism or there is decreased glucose utilization. For example, in the, the organs where the glucose is utilized, there may be defect in those uh, organs. Therefore, it causes the raised glucose levels in the blood. And based on these features, either there is defect in the insulin production, which is the pancreas, or there is defect in the glucose utilization. And these are the three major organs which utilizes glucose and store glucose. One of them is the liver, the other is the skeletal muscles and the peripheral fat. There can also be defect in the target organs, where the insulin, which is produced in the islet cells, released in the blood and goes and act on these uh, receptors on the target cells. So, if there is any defect in the target cells receptors, the insulin will not act and the glucose levels may be raised. So, any of these three mechanism may be involved in the hyperglycemia. Now, what is diabetes mellitus? According to the American Societies of Diabetes and the WHO, they are defining criteria for the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus. So, any fasting glucose level of more than 126 milligram percent or any random blood glucose level more than 20 milligram percent or the after the the loading dose of glucose that is 75 gram at the end of the 2 hours the glucose level is more than 200 milligram then the person is diagnosed as diabetic but to be remember that only the one single reading is not enough for the diagnosis of diabetes. 
all these tests has to be repeated at other time for the definitive diagnosis of uh, diabetes mellitus. There are uh, criteria which define what is the pre-diabetic uh, or the, the people who are more prone to diabetes, what is the pre-diabetic state, what do we call as the impaired glucose tolerance test. There are some criteria that is the fasting blood glucose between 100 and 125 milligram or the 2 hour plasma glucose between the 140 and uh, 199 milligram percent or the glycated hemoglobin levels which are less than the defining criteria of uh, diabetes mellitus. Now, what is the significance of diagnosing the pre-diabetes or the impaired glucose tolerance? It has been found in large studies that uh, one fourth of these patients who are pre-diabetic, they develop diabetes mellitus over the time and mostly within 5 years. The second is all those patients who are pre-diabetic, the chances of cardiovascular complications are more as compared to general public. So that is the importance of diagnosing the pre-diabetic and these patient has to be kept under strict diabetic control. Basically, diabetes mellitus, there are many causes of diabetes mellitus. The mainly there are uh, what we call the type 1 and the type 2 diabetes. Earlier, we used to call as the juvenile diabetes mellitus type 1 and the adult onset diabetes mellitus which is type 2. But now juvenile and adult onset, the terms has been uh, discarded. They are obsolete terms and we use the type 1 and type 2 diabetes. There are basic differences. Diabetes mellitus is classified into two groups, type 1 and type 2. Earlier, we used to call type 1 diabetes as the juvenile onset diabetes mellitus and the type 2 diabetes as the adult onset diabetes mellitus. Now, the juvenile and adult onset terminology has been deleted. They are obsolete. They are just called the type 1 diabetes mellitus and type 2 diabetes mellitus. The majority of the patients are of type 2 diabetes mellitus which comprises about 90 to 90 percent, 5 percent of all cases and the minority about 5 to 10 percent are type 1 diabetes mellitus. So, the majority of the patients are type 2 diabetes mellitus. There are basically some differences between the type 1 and the type 2 diabetes mellitus. For example, type 1 diabetes mellitus, the clinical onset is in the childhood or adolescence. The children, they are of normal weight or they may be present with the weight loss. As compared to the type 2 diabetes mellitus, where majority of the patients are obese, the in type 1 diabetes mellitus, there is decrease in insulin secretion and there is absolute deficiency of insulin hormones. Whereas in the type 2 diabetes, the insulin may be normal or may be increased in the initial stages and it is decreased in the later stages. The type 1 diabetes mellitus is uh, autoimmune and one can uh, estimate the autoantibodies in the blood. These patients are more prone to diabetic ketoacidosis in the insulin uh, in the absence of insulin therapy. The majority of the type 1 diabetes patient, they may show some linkage to the MSC class 2 genes and uh, in the pathogenesis, actually there is a dysfunction of T cells which causes the destruction of the islet cells and decrease in the islet cell populations. So, what are the differences in the pathology of uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus? mostly seen in the animal models and uh, in the experimental studies and sometime in the autopsies. It has been found that in type 1 diabetes mellitus, there is inflammation in the islet cells. These are the lymphocytes which are infiltrating in between the islet cells. So, this is known as the insulinitis and uh, there is a decrease in the number, atrophy of these uh, islet cells and decrease in the number and the end stage, there is a loss of these uh, islet cells.
there is in the type 2 diabetes mellitus the number may be increased initially but it is later on it is decreased but is more characteristic is the deposition of the amyloid material this is the amyloid materials which is deposited in the islets and causes atrophy of these cells now what is the etiology or the causal relationship is not well known but probably the islet these amyloid deposition causes atrophy of these uh, islet cells now the type 1 diabetes it is a multifactorial there are some genetic factors there are some environmental factors so it has a complex genetic association and it has been found that uh, there may be some uh, loci which is related to the class 2 msc molecules on the chromosome 6p21 region and these patients who are hla positive for hla dr3 dr4 or both they are more prone to type 1 diabetes there may be some uh, gene encoding for the t cell inhibitory receptors which are involved in the type 1 diabetes it has been found that uh, many patient of type 1 diabetes the onset is after the viral infections the patient present with some uh, fever and immediately there is a onset of diabetes so there is maybe correlation between the viral infections maybe some common antigen between the virus which are affecting the islet cells that may be the molecular mimicry involved in the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes now there are some direct evidences and there are some indirect evidences in the pathogenesis of uh, type 1 diabetes regarding the autoimmunity the presence of inflammation t cells the antibodies against some of the islet cells component or maybe the antibodies circulating antibodies against the insulin glutamic acid decarboxylase which is involved in the synthesis of uh, insulin all these factors contribute to the autoimmunity there is a reduction in the b cells in the end and it was found that there may be involvement of the cd4 positive helper t cells and the cd8 positive cytotoxic t cells or maybe some cytokines which are secreted by the inflammatory cells which infiltrate the islet cell and causes the destruction of these uh, islet cells uh, this cartoon shows the the phenomenon of autoimmunity as in all other diseases it may be that uh, cd the some of the antigens which are released from the islet cell they go to the regional lymph node and with the help of uh, cd for the positive cells helper cells they and the msc class 1 they cause the activation of these cells and these cells produce some uh, cytokines which may directly affect the islet cells or may affect the cytotoxic t cells may involve the macrophages and all these contribute ultimately in the destruction of islet cells now by these patient who are pro predisposed to diabetes mellitus type 1 genetic factors are already there since birth but why they present after uh, sometimes in the late childhood or in adolescent initially there may be some uh, genetic predisposition there may be some other factors which are involved for example the viral infections and all these uh, it takes time for the destruction of the islet cells and when there is absolute uh, deficiency of uh, insulin at that time the patient present with diabetes mellitus as compared to the type 1 diabetes type 2 diabetes mellitus the genetic factor may be involved there are some environmental influences or there may be some metabolic defects of all the environmental factors the most important is the obesity and the lifestyle the people who are more obese who are sedentary lifestyles who have dietary habits who takes uh, more uh, junk foods they are more prone to type 2 diabetes as compared to type 1 diabetes there is a strong genetic disposition for type uh, 2 diabetes it has been found that more than 90% of the monozygotic twins 
they develop diabetes mellitus. In the first degree relatives, the chances of type 2 diabetes are about um, more than 5 to 10 times as compared to the general population. There may be some uh, metabolic defects as the person become obese, people develop insulin resistance and it ultimately leads to beta cell dysfunctions. So, all those factors which are involved in the glucose metabolism may be involved in the type 2 diabetes. For example, in the liver, the glucose which is stored as glycogen broken down and it causes the gluconeogenesis which is the factor for the raised fasting blood sugar. In the skeletal muscle, the underutilization or the decreased utilization of the glucose leads to the postprandial glucose level increase. In the fat, there may be lipolysis in the absence of uh, insulin. Actually, insulin is the, the best uh, anabolic hormones. So, whenever there is a deficiency of insulin, the catabolism starts and that ultimately leads to the raised glucose levels in the blood. Now, there may be some other factors which are involved. It has been found that the people who are obese, they develop a resistance to the insulin and this resistance to the insulin is the most important factor in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. Maybe that there is uh, some blockage of the, the action of the insulin on the target organs that leads to the down regulation of this uh, downstream pathway and ultimately decreased uh, utilization of glucose. It has been found that uh, the obese people, the environment is more of pro-inflammatory, many cytokines are released by these uh, adipocytes which causes the inflammation and ultimately leads to the insulin resistance. The another mechanism which may be possible that may be some um, genetic abnormality the insulin resistance, may be some receptors the, on the cells which are mutated and the insulin action does not take place on these receptors. And this ultimately leads to the underutilization of glucose. So, all these factors actually leads to the NF kappa pathway activation, which is the most important pathway in the inflammation and ultimately leads to insulin resistance. There may be some other factors, for example, the release of uh, free fatty acids from these adipocytes, which causes a uh, insulin resistance or maybe some um, adiponectins, leptin levels which are all in, involved in the metabolism of uh, fat which leads to insulin resistance and this insulin resistance initially the beta cells, the islet cell they try to compensate this uh, insulin levels. So, there is um, hyperplasia but ultimately it leads to the dysfunction of these cells and the number of these cells also decrease as I told because of the deposition of the amyloid which may cause the pressure atrophy. So, this chart shows the pathogenesis of uh, type 2 diabetes which may be an environmental factor which may be the obesity or may be some genetic factors which ultimately leads to the insulin resistance and the dysfunction of the beta islet cells leading to the hyperglycemia and type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Now, initially as I told that this uh, insulin resistance leads to hyperplasia of these islet cells and increased level of insulin, but uh, in the end stage because of the resistance there is a dysfunction of the beta cells and uh, decreased number of beta cells which causes increased uh, glucose levels. Now, this uh, cartoon shows the complication of diabetes. Diabetes affect from uh, head to toe, all organs are affected, there is no organ which is not affected by the diabetes and this is the slow damage. Therefore, many times it is not uh, realized in the initial stages when the full blown complications occur 
the patient may realize that the diabetes has affected all the organs. Now, complica vascular complications of diabetes may be the macrovascular, may be the microvascular. The microvascular mainly involve the small vessel, which causes the nephropathy, retinopathy, and neuropathy. Where the macrovascular, they involve the major vessels, medium-sized vessels, and all organs are affected. For example, it causes the atherosclerosis. All these patients, they are more prone to, or they have accelerated uh, atherosclerosis, which causes the myocardial infarctions, cerebrovascular accidents, the peripheral vascular diseases, etc. Now, it has been found that the chances of uh, atherosclerosis in the diabetic patients are more as compared to general population. One is the raised glucose levels, the other is most of the patient, for example, the type 2 diabetes patient, they are associated with the dyslipidemia. So, along with the dyslipidemia, these chances of uh, atherosclerosis are more, which is further complicated by the hypertension. Diabetic patients are more prone to hypertension also. So, all these factors leads to damage of the endothelial cells which causes the atherosclerosis. The other is the highland arteriosclerosis and the diabetic microangiopathies. Now, as I mentioned that uh, diabetic patients because of the atherosclerosis of the major vessels in these patients they develop atherosclerosis and thrombosis and the embolism of the medium sized vessels, larger vessels and affect the hand and uh, feet mostly the lower limbs and many of these patients, they present with gangrene. Myocardial infarction because of the atherosclerosis, hypertension and dyslipidemia is more common in diabetes patient. The point to remember that uh, the patient who developed the myocardial infarction, who are diabetic, they do not present with symptoms. This is what we call as the silent infarct. These patient because they do not have the pain during the attack, so the chances of uh, mortality are more. Secondly, in the reproductive age group, females usually do not get uh, myocardial infarction unless there is some predisposing factor for the lipid metabolism. But in diabetes, even the female, they can develop myocardial infarction during the reproductive age. Now, the gangrene, initially the patient have uh, after some injury, small injury may develop trophic ulcers, non healing of the ulcers and uh, auto amputation of these fingers. And ultimately, when it progress or the diabetes is not under control, the patient may have gangrene of the lower limbs, sometimes the renal atherosclerosis along with the microangiopathy causes the shrinking of the kidneys. The microangiopathy can involve the in the kidney, any compartment of the kidney may be involved, but the most common is the glomerulus, then the interstitium and the tubules, blood vessels. In the glomeruli, there is a diffuse thickening of these glomeruli, these uh, tuft, there is, uh, which is causes because of the, the collagen 4 is increased, there is more leakage of the proteins. So, most of the proteins are deposited on the blood vessels and causes thickening. There may be the involvement of the vessels, the arteriosclerosis which is of the medium or the medium size vessels. There may be pyelonephritis. These patients are more prone to interstitial inflammation. And point to remember that the pyelonephritis in diabetes may develop necrotizing papillitis. There are very few conditions where one get the necrotizing papillitis and one of them is the diabetes mellitus. There may be renal tubule involvement. The one is the thickening of the basement membrane like the microangiopathy at all other places or there be, may be more uh, glycogen in the epithelial cells, but we call the Armamani syndrome. And because of all these features, the kidney becomes shrunken, 
they are smaller in size. So, this is one of the cause of a small contracted kidney besides some other causes. Now, this shows the normal capillary glomerular tuft, this shows the thickening of the basement membrane and these are the glomeruli where there is a thickening or there is a tuft and there is an increase in the mesangial matrix. These are the sometimes one gets the this nodular deposit. This is eosinophilic material just like the amyloid and it has to be differentiated from the amyloid. One can do the stain for the amyloid, but the only point uh, which has to be remembered in diabetes is that these nodules, they push the capillaries toward the periphery, whereas in the amyloid, they are entangled. So, these lesions are known as the nodule sclerosis or Carmelstall Wilson disease, KW lesions. Now, the very interesting is that uh, in diabetes mellitus, both afferent as well the efferent vessels at the hilum of the glomerulus are involved. They show thickening. This is as compared to the other conditions where only the efferent vessels are involved, but not the efferent. And all these conditions has to be differentiated from the, the old age changes, from the hypertensive changes and from the amyloidosis. Now, why these patients are uh, more prone to infections, especially the pyelonephritis? Because uh, many of these uh, function of these protective mechanism, for example, the polymorphs, the macrophages, the migration, the release of the chemokine, they are defective in these patients, which ultimately leads to increased chances of infections. The ocular complications are many, but few are the cataract is more common. Diabetic patient develop cataract in younger age as compared to normal population. They are more prone to glaucoma, diabetic retinopathies, optic atrophies. All these are complications of the diabetic microangiopathy. The other organ which is affected by the microangiopathy is the peripheral neuropathies. These patients have very characteristic gloves and stocks uh, presentation of uh, involvement of the nerves. For example, the hands and feet are involved and uh, these patients, they become the symptoms because of the the, the involvement of the axons, small nerve fibers and sometimes this uh, peripheral neuropathy is painful. It may be that the vessels which supply these uh, nerves, smaller vessels which becomes uh, thickened because of the microangiopathies or there may be direct uh, damage to the axons which is uh, further complicated by the trophic ulcers because the decreased sensation these patients they become uh, ulcers especially on the pressure points in the feet which ultimately complicated with the, by the gangrene and leads to amputations. Now, these the as I mentioned these patients, they have very symmetric involvement of the nerves, what is called the gloves and stocking pattern of uh, neuropathy and the sensory is more as compared to the motor dysfunction. Sometimes they may, there may be involvement the autonomic neuropathy which manifests as sexual dysfunctions or disturbances of the bladder and bowel. Rarely these patients have diabetes mononeuropathy. Now, why these uh, microangiopathic complications develop? Basically, there are three mechanisms. It may be non-enzymic glycosylation or it may be the activation of the protein C pathway or it may be the there are some organs where there is a passive influx of the glucose because of the raised levels and this polyol pathway is affected and leads to the microangiopathy. In the non-enzymatic glycosylation, 
it is actually the process by which the glucose chemically attaches to the free amino acids of protein without the help or the involvement of any enzymes and uh, these uh, product what we call the formation of uh, advanced glycosylation end products which have the receptors on certain uh, tissues and goes and attach there and uh, activate those and causes complications the ace receptors they are on uh, many cells but monocyte macrophages t cells endothelial cells smooth muscle cells mesangial cells and neurons are the one which are rich in these uh, ace receptors so these ace uh, products they goes and attach there causes activation of these uh, tissues and ultimately lead to the complication now this may affect the matrix it may affect the intracellular compartment it may affect the plasma proteins and all those mechanism which uh, leads to atherosclerosis or the vascular complication or the decreased uh, for example the fibrinolytic pathway which causes the the lysis of the fibrinogen which is affected so all these mechanism actually leads to the coagulation and decreased uh, destruction of these uh, the thrombus and leads to the microangiopathic complications or the macroangiopathic complications now because of the disturbances of the polyol pathway as i mentioned this uh, some tissue don't uh, require uh, insulin for the glucose transport and because of the raised glucose levels that is this uh, glucose goes to this um, tissue inside and uh, there is an involvement it is broken into the fructose and there is an involvement of the sorbitol which is a uh, intermediate product and it it is uh, more toxic to the, some of the tissues on the other hand there is the utilization of the nadh nadph and this is also required for the the glutathion pathway and ultimately leads, leads to the the activation of the oxidative stress and the oxidative pathway and free radical injuries all these factors contribute for the the complications now this shows the pathogenesis of the diabetes mellitus there is a decrease in the insulin there may be decrease in the glucose utilization it all leads to hyperglycemia and uh, this hyperglycemia affected uh, many organs there is under utilization of glucose in the fat in the muscle in the liver and this glucose threshold for the kidney when it is raised the glucose goes to in the urine it causes uh, glycosuria and because of the osmosis it causes the polyuria and there is a uh, body needs more water so there is uh, polydipsia and because insulin is less so there is catabolism all these leads to the polyphasia so this explain the the three symptoms which are common in uh, diabetes polyuria polydipsia and polyphasia ketosis ketonuria and coma are more common in the type 1 diabetes whereas in the type 2 diabetes it is the hyperosmotic diuresis which sometimes leads to the coma this show the in nutshell the the mechanism of type 1 and uh, type 2 diabetes and in the end this picture show the complication of uh, diabetes which are very important and the most important one of the cause of uh, mortality and morbidity in diabetic patients thank you